All right. Um, hello. Uh, is that me? That be you. Just take off your mic on that one for me, thanks. I should be there. All right, let us begin. Um, Paul, just give me a little bit off of, uh, just a little bit more on this one, on, my, on this. No, no, on, on my... Um, on my video, just take 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 it down a little bit, just to, to get my whole head in the frame. <laughs> just a touchdown. That that's fine. That's good. All right. Uh, let us begin. Uh, we are a little bit behind. Um, leaving meeting? No, I don't know. I'm hoping. Double check. This is um, going through all right for me. I've had to change my. Um, what is that there? Whatever that is on the top there. Let's just take off that for me, Sam. There's, there's a message on the top there. Turn up volume or something. Uh, and I don't want to leave meeting. Look, uh, we've had to make some, some changes. This is a new, um, for those who are picking me up on YouTube, this is a new website which I've had to uh, use because the last site, somebody unmuted their phone. Uh, and and uh, they spoke about talking through, through the, the Sabbath school, which I only noticed afterwards. When I was listening to it, and a few people commented that somebody was speaking throughout the entire, um, so it was a bit awkward from that point of view. So I've had to I've had to put in a new I've had to put a new site in, which is one that doesn't um, allow you to unmute. So let us begin anyway. So that's I've been a bit delayed trying to sort that out, but uh, we are here, and so let us let us just go. Let's go with what we have in in the Lord's name and see how we go. Um, don't know why it has leaving this meeting, but we'll sort that out after. All right, uh, let us let us. So we're dealing with the question and uh, on waiting on the Lord. So let's see how that works out for us. Let us pray, Father. We thank you again for this time we meet together, and we invite your Spirit to be with us and guide all our thoughts for Jesus' sake. Amen. So I'm seeing a little split on the on this thing. As I said, it's a it's a new a new one I'm using, but we'll see how it works out. Um, Paul, Paul, is there any way you could take my image off on that one? Oh, sorry. Let's let's go out on that one. I <laughs> uh, got you. Let's go back. Let's go back. How do I get back here? Um, uh, all right. I'm trying to figure this out here. It's, I say it's a little bit different, and I don't want to leave the meeting. Um, okay, sorry. Um, stop share. Right. Okay. Let's let's try that again. Let's try that again. And okay. Uh, just go to panelists, and then I'll make you co-host. Okay, there you go. Right, that should do it. All right, and let's go back to share. All right, as I say, uh, for those who are looking online, we're just trying to get a new, this new um, Zoom program in place. So it's a bit of up and down, but we'll get there eventually. Let's see if I can get back to where I was. There we go. And we need to come back here. All right. So, hopefully that is all right now. Oh boy, it's been a bit of up and down, but pray for me. Pray for us. Let's, let's see if we can get it right. Unfortunately, again, there's a lot of content we need to go through. Now, waiting on the Lord is, is a subject for today. And, um, and the question of waiting on the Lord is, what does that mean exactly? What does it mean to wait on the Lord? Any thoughts on that, anyone? What do you mean? Anticipate, yes. Yes. The looking forward to him, what he's going to do. Any other thoughts? Yes. Yes, finding out what God's will for your life is and so on. So there is, um, so wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I see on the Lord. So, so, so the Psalmist, Psalm 27 is encouraging us to wait. Look at Lamentations. The Lord is good to those who hope is in him, to, who, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. 
So we have this concept of waiting on the Lord. Uh, Paul, you just check the YouTube for me, make sure it's coming through all right. Um, now this is the question really. Is this, is this what waiting on the Lord means? <laughs> you see that we really have to define that a little more clearly. You know, does waiting on the Lord mean sitting by idly, uh, sort of just biding your time until he turns up? Because um, that's what many people might think waiting on the Lord means. But there are actually seven different words for waiting on the Lord, none of which means being idle. So actually a better way, a better word for, for the word that is used for waiting in the Hebrew, it's translated waiting, but in the Hebrew, it more implies trusting and having faith in him for what he will reveal. So it's revealing an action. So Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is a better way of describing waiting on the Lord. Trust in the Lord rather than wait in the Lord. It's the same same word that's used. With all your heart, lean out your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge or submit to him. He will make your path straight. That is what the Bible is talking about. Does that make difference now? It's not sitting idly by in a chair and hoping God will pass by you. It's more about submitting yourself, trusting in him, and, and, and then following it, following it up in action. So, so we'll look at that in a little more detail. We do know that waiting on the Lord is life-changing. It has an impact on your life. You see, look at Psalm 30 verse 5. For his anger endures for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but what comes next? When you wait on the Lord, what happens? Joy comes in the morning. So, there's a, so waiting on the Lord is trusting in the Lord, submitting to him, operating by faith that works by love. And it creates action. Look at Psalm 143, verse 8. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my what? Trust in you. That's the concept of waiting. Show me the way I should go. That's the concept of action. For, I, for to you I entrust my life. So, so when we talk about waiting on the Lord, it is not sitting down idly by watching Netflix. That is certainly not the concept that the Bible is trying to teach at all. Here's another word, Psalm 126, verse 6. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. So it's a life change. Things waiting on the Lord has a life changing effect. The Psalm 137, 18 and 19. The blameless spend their days under the Lord's care, and their inheritance will endure forever. In times of disaster, they will not wither. In days of famine, they will enjoy plenty. So, so we're dealing here with what the concept of waiting is. It's trusting in the Lord, submitting to him, and, and seeing how he will bring things to pass. He will, he will richly bless us. He will not put us to shame. Psalm 37 verse 7 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret yourself when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked schemes. So, so, to the, so, so we're waiting on the Lord. Don't fret. What does that mean? Don't become what? Anxious, don't get upset when people are doing well. Have we ever seen that? Your friends, people won the lottery, you can't pay a mortgage, and so on, you know, and, and you're trying to figure out why is it, David had the same question, why it is that the, the wealthy always seem to succeed? And it's the same question we have. Um, he says, but don't get anxious when people are succeeding um, and when they also carry out their wicked things. So there's a lot of wicked things going on in the world. The Bible says, don't get anxious about it. God is going to deal with those, and you'll see why in a short while. Look at Psalm 37, verse 9, why he says, don't get anxious. Why? Verse 7 says, don't get, don't get anxious. Verse, th verse 9 says, so those who are evil will be what? Destroyed, but those who hope in the Lord will inherit the land. What land will God, those people who hope in the Lord inherit? What land will we inherit? Blessed are the meek, for ye shall inherit what? The earth. When God restores the earth, God's people will, 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 um, will, will inherit it all. So, so we got to wait on the Lord, and that really is the subject for today. That was by way of introduction. So there's the outline of what we will cover today. Uh, we'll look at the call of waiting. We'll look at how we wait in humility, how we wait during difficult times, how we wait in the Sabbath, during the Sabbath, and waiting for the glorious change. If we get through all of that, that would be a wonderful thing. So let's start with the call of waiting. Now, every, everything we do requires waiting. So waiting, you know, like a woman who is pregnant, she waits. What does she wait for? For the delivery of a baby, but she's not sitting down doing nothing. You see? And similarly, somebody who is sick and you're praying for the Lord to deliver them, you're, you're actively doing things and so on. So we're waiting for the Lord's coming. We are doing, not sitting down doing nothing. We are 
patiently involved. So let's look at Psalm 39, which is what we're going to be covering in this first part section here, Psalm 39. Let's go on. And now, Lord, what do I wait for? That's a good question, isn't it? What am I trusting you for? Remember the word wait should be better translated trust. Lord, what, I, what do we trust you for? Because our hope is in you. What should we be trusting the Lord for? What do you think? Anybody, everybody, anybody. What would you trust the Lord for? For everything, yes. For your, for your day to day, your coming, going in and coming out. What again? Any other thoughts? What does the Jesus say? When, in the Lord's Prayer, give us this day or what? Daily bread. So we're asking God for us daily living. So what, what else? And for forgiveness, isn't it? Forgive us of our, our sins or trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So I waited patiently for the Lord. And what did he do? He turned to me and heard my cry. So, so waiting is trusting. That means praying. So obviously, waiting for, waiting for, for David in this particular psalm is praying. He was praying to the Lord, and he was waiting for God to give him an answer. Does God always answer us immediately? What do you think? No. no. There are three th that God always answers a prayer. God always answers. The Bible says all, everything in Christ Jesus says, yeah, and amen. God always answers a prayer. But what answer can he give you? When you pray, he can say yes, or he can say no. That's still an answer. Or what's the third option? Wait. Yes, no, wait. But God always answers prayer. God, there is no prayer that God will not answer for the child of God. Yes, he will say sometimes. No, he will say sometimes. Or he will say, wait. Wait on the Lord. So, he, so David says, I waited patiently for the Lord. I was praying. And he heard, they turned to me and heard my cry. And the, the operative word there is perseverance. What does perseverance mean? Don't. Don't give in. Don't give up. Be patient. Don't give up. Patience, patience implies persevering. Don't give up. Because you prayed once, don't stop praying. Jesus says, ask and you shall receive. Now, that's in the English. But if you go to the Greek, it is ask and keep asking. It, it's, it's also called a present continu continuing text. Uh, tense. So you've got to ask and keep asking. You've got to seek and keep seeking. You've got to knock and keep knocking. So, so you, it's, it's a concept of persevering. Don't just pray and give up because you didn't get the answer yesterday, um, immediately after. All right? Don't get, you know, don't succumb to disappointment. Don't believe that God will not answer your prayer. He will. He always does. But you have to prepare, you have to be prepared for God to say no. You know, sometimes, what, so, so why would God say no to some of our prayers? James says, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss with wrong intention, that you might consume it on your lust. So sometimes God says, you know, and this is a child of God. He says, look, sometimes what we're asking for is not what I feel I can give you because it will cause a problem for you. Your, your, your lustful behavior is what's drawing the prayer. So sometimes we have to leave that, all times you have to leave God to answer the prayer according to his divine prerogative. He might say no sometimes. That's okay. That's okay. All you want to do, now how do you know when God says no? How do you know when God says yes? Because you got the answer. You got the answer to your prayer. You prayed, you receive an answer. God says yes. How do you know when God says no? Yeah, but how do you know that's not wait? You understand? How can you tell the difference between no and wait? Because yes means I got the answer. What no means, how do you can know? When God tells you stop praying. God will tell you stop praying. You're not getting it. You remember, you remember, you remember what, what had happened with um, Paul? Remember Paul was praying? How many times he prayed about this thing that was bothering him? Three times. And on the third occasion, the Lord said, don't pray anymore. You're not getting it. My grace is sufficient for you. So after that, Paul stopped praying. Because God said to him, no, you're not getting it. So you pray until God says no. And if you can't get a no, you pray until God says wait. You've you got to pray until you receive an answer. So, so that's how we do it. You pray if God says yes, stop praying. If he says no, he'll tell you and then stop praying for it. Or you pray until God says wait. All right, so God is faithful. And he, you know, if we wait on him, we will be sure he will work for us. Even if 
we don't always see things the way he sees it. Sometimes God gives you an answer different to what you're asking for. Do you think that's all right if God does that? You ask, you, you know, here's this, here's this lady who wants to get married. You know, she wants tall, dark, and handsome. God gives us short, fat, and ugly. <laughs> so, you, you know, and that happens too. Because God says that short, fat, and ugly one is the one that will stay with you and keep you in faith. The tall, dark, and handsome is the guy running around with every girl he could find. So sometimes, sometimes you have to say, you know, God, sometimes what I want may not necessarily be how you choose to answer it. You've got to leave your prayer for God to answer it according to his sovereign will. So when I pray, I always pray that God would answer my prayer according to his sovereign will and according to his divine plan. So it has got to be according to the plan of God, and the plan of God involves waiting. Waiting means that you receive the thing only when the fullness of time comes. Does that make sense to everybody? God will answer your prayer when the fullness of time comes. Yes, Liz? It can as well. It can come after, depending on what it is for. I mean, if it is something for you, then having, you'll get it before you, before you die. If it is something for your family, then God can give you the answer after. You know, you pray for your husband, your wife, or your child, and sometimes after your, you die, your child comes to the Lord, or your husband, or your wife. So that happens. But if God is going to give you something for you to use, they'll get it before you die. You'll definitely get it before you die. All right, so, so it's a deep longing for God, uh, and, and, and the psalmist compares it to being, to being uh, like a, a parched land looking for water. That's how, that's how we have to wait on the Lord. You God, oh my God, earnestly I seek you. You see the word there, earnestly. What does earnestly mean? Diligently, with sincerity. Not a sort of you know, half-hearted way we approach it sometimes. Then David says, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. He says, he says like, it's like a dry land. What happens if you put water on dry land? It soaks it up. When it, when it is completely saturated, the water flows over. But if it's dry, it just absorbs it, absorbs it. And, and he says, like a dry land, I will seek for you um, and wait for you. So let's look at the call of waiting. We're looking at that. God and his creation. Are... Now, interestingly, you know, the Bible tells us God is waiting for us. Did you know that? God is waiting for us. Now, let, let me prove that to you. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. So, so, so the entire creation is waiting on us. You know, we're not waiting on him. The, the, no, you see, we are waiting. We, we say we are waiting for the Lord to come. It's not we are waiting for him. He is waiting for us. Now, he's looking for the revelation to come. What does that mean? For God's, for the children of God to be revealed. What does that mean? Let me give you another text, Romans 8, 22. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning as the, in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. In other words, the creation wants to deliver the people of God so that we can have a new creation, but God is still waiting on us. So we've got to change our concept of what the second coming is. In the second coming, we're waiting for him, we say, but according to the Bible, he's really waiting on us. What is he waiting on us for? Yes, he's looking for the, for the revelation of the children. The, apocalypse, the word is apocalypsis. He's looking for the, for the, rev the revealing of the, the God's people in, in their fullness. But you're not seeing it. You know, servant of the Lord, Ellen White says, when, when, when the character of God is fully reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. Yeah, 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 you know, so it's actually the opposite of what we think. We, we, God says, I'm waiting for you to get the revelation. I need to see the revelation of God in you. That is why the Bible says Christ in you, the hope of glory. God is looking for the revelation of himself in us. And when he sees the revelation of himself, now there's a way that the Bible describes it in the Old Testament. He calls it the refiner's gold. You, you, you saw that? He stands as a refiner of gold and silver. What's he looking for? How, do, how does a, a refiner of gold and silver know when to stop? When he sees, when he sees the, the reflection of himself in it. That's how he knows he's burnt off the, 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 the dross of the, of the earth because gold is mixed with earth. So God is waiting for us to, to, reveal, to, be, revealed, to be revealed before he comes. He's actually waiting on us. Not so much that we are waiting on him. 
So while we're waiting, we are of course called to bear witness. Why do we call, why do we bear witness to the fallen to fallen humanity? If I'm saved, why do I need to tell anybody about it? Is there any reason to do that? Yeah, but why? Why do, why do we need to, to give a revelation to other people? Salvation to other. Why do we need to offer salvation to other people? If I'm saved, why do I need to offer it? Any thoughts? No. Uh, one is your responsibility, yes, but does it go beyond that? Yeah. Like a watchman on the wall, you want to warn people of what's to come. That's actually a very good point. I'll come to that in a minute. Yep. Because you love the brethren. God, so, you see, the reason we, we share the word is because the same reason that Jesus shared the word and Father shared the word. Why did Father share, share Jesus with us? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The sharing of, of salvation is based on love. If you don't love the world, you will not share the, the, the love of Christ with them. And, and so it does make you wonder to what extent. Now, I'm not talking about love the world or the things of the world. Because the Bible says if any man love the world or the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. But it's not discussing that. We're discussing people. Does that make sense? Not, not your car and your house and your money and so on. We're discussing people. And if you love people, you will share with them the gospel because of what you just said, actually. The danger they're in. Now, I'll give you a story. Let's say, for example, a good friend of yours came home by you at your house. And, you know, came upstairs. It's, it's evening time and so on. And uh, you had your dog, you said, look, I'm just going to, I'm just going to go let the dog pee because he wants to pee somewhere and you don't want to pee in the house. As you go outside in the yard, you see a big poisonous snake. What's a poisonous snake in Australia? A brown snake? That's pretty bad, isn't it? Yeah. So you see this brown snake in the, in, in, in the, in the, in the, um, in, in the grass where you're going to put the dog to pee. So what do you do? You run back inside. You don't let the dog pee and you're going to get stung with the snake. Now, when you reach upstairs, the, the chap, the, 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 your friend says, you know, I just need to go outside for a little bit of air. Now, you know when he goes outside, he's going straight into the brown snake. What would you say? You'd stop. You'd warn him. You'd warn him. You're, not, you're not trying to force religion down his throat. You're trying to warn him of the danger that he's going into. That doesn't make sense. You see, salvation is warning somebody of the danger they're in and then giving them an opportunity to be saved. And if you love your friend, you won't just tell him to go right ahead. If you don't like him, you say go right, go right outside. You, show him where, you tell him to go where the brown snake is. You want him to get strong. But if you love your friend, you'd warn him of the danger that he's going to get himself into. And the point is, the reason we tell people about salvation is because we're warning them of the danger they're in. Not because we're trying to force religion down their throat. You're just saying to them, look, you, you are in a dangerous place. And if you don't take a new step, you will, you will, you will end up with harm. And that's why, that's what Jesus came to do. He came to warn the world of the danger that they're in and to give them an option. All right, here's Acts 1.8. We are to wait. We will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my what? Witnesses. What's a witness? Somebody who gives evidence of what they have seen or what they have heard or what they have touched. That's the only evidence you can give. You can't give evidence of what somebody told you. If, if, if you're given evidence of, some, of something somebody told you, what, what would the, the judge say to you? It, it's not submissible. Why? What's it called? It's called what? It, it's circum, well, yes, circumstantial is one. Circumstantial is well, the, the surroundings of what seems to, to implicate you. But you can't provide evidence if they say that's third party. You can't, you can't give evidence from somebody else. You can only give evidence of what you have seen, what you have heard, and what you have done yourself. Or else it's not, it's not admissible in court. Well, I heard John say that Mary shot the man. Well, did you see Mary shoot? No. Well, then that's not admissible. You, you know, you, it's just what John told you. So you can only give evidence. You can only be a witness of that which you have personally seen and, and, and you have tasted or handled. No, that's what John says. That which we have seen and we have handled even the, 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 the word of life. That you can give testimony to. Other than that, you can't. So he says you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Now, what, what happened immediately before that text? What was happening immediately before that text? Jesus, no, yeah, even, no before that, that comes right after. What comes before that text was he spent how many days with them? 40 days. He spent 40 days with them. And, and he says that was 10 days before Pentecost. He says, look, wait for those 10 days. Tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power. So they had a little bit of work to do. 
um, to, to fix up, but they could give testimony that they had seen and handled and, and ate with this man called Jesus. This was not a make-believe story, it was real. So we had to tell the story. Now, the, the, the point is we had to wait. Remember, wait means trusting, depending on him, walking by faith, operating by faith. Prayer, we already said, speaking of him. But we had to wait in humility. Now, the trouble is that in this world, there will be, life is hard. Do you say life, life is hard? Would you agree? Life in this world is suffering. That's, that's the first tenet of Buddhism, but it's actually correct biblically. Life is suffering. If you get five minutes of happiness, be, be very happy you got it because most people won't. But, um, but life is suffering. So, you know, we have to be accustomed to, to, the, to the conflicts and the, and the temptations and the hardships that is coming to everyone. No temptation hath taken you such as common as to all men. So we're not unique, but God through the temptation will provide a way of escape that what? You will be able to bear it. So God gives us some ability to bear it. But everybody is going through hardships. What are some of the hardships we're going through right now? Give me some hardships. Financial, buying a house, that's pretty hard. Going to the supermarket, relationship. You know, you know, right now, one in three people in Australia between 18 and 25 are lonely. That's why they, they spend so much time on social media. One in three have no friends. But you know, it, it's like diabetes. You know, anybody knows what they call diabetes? There's a term for it. It's called starvation in the midst of plenty. So, so, so there's lots of sugar around, but the body can't use it. And we seem to be in that same situation. There's lots, how many people are alive on earth now? Eight billion people, to be exact. A little over eight billion, actually, because it was eight billion about six months ago. Eight billion people. And yet, people are lonely. One in three people are lonely, can't have anybody to talk to. And then the second one has very few people to talk to, and that's why all these apps, lonely apps, come up. You know, eHarmony and, and G-Harmony, or whatever kind of harmony they have. But those apps are, are, are blossoming because people have nobody to talk to, they have nowhere to go. And, and the, the third person is probably unhappy. So, you know, so like, we are in trouble. You know, and, uh, and, so, and so there's lots of these issues going on. The world is, in, the world is suffering. Mental health, is that a problem? That's a major problem all over the world. Since COVID is worse, because people have become isolated. And now there's also working, people work from home. That actually turns out to probably be not as good because therefore you have no social interaction at all. All you have is four walls. Now, you're for, we're fortunate because we have church and so we take for granted church, but there are lots of people who have no, no family, you know what I mean? They have no friends. And, and the, 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 thing, the thing propagates itself. The more, the more you are lonely, the more lonely you become. Why? Sorry? Sure, yeah, well, that too, but you, know, you start to enjoy your own company. And you forget social skills. So you need to be in a social place to develop social skills. And the more lonely you, the more lonely you are, the less you develop, you lose your social skills. And secondly, you enjoy it. Like, I, I enjoy my own company, I'll be very honest with you. I, the only reason I come to church is because I have to. I'm only kidding. <laughs> I enjoy, but you understand what I'm saying? I enjoy the company of church, but, but you know, people who haven't got that opportunity, they won't, they're just in four walls and, and, and they become more lonely. So the world is in trouble. Now here's what Jesus said, John 16:33. I have told you these things so that it, in me you might have peace. So he says, in this world you're gonna have trouble. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So he says, don't worry, I'm an overcomer, and you can have peace in this world. In the midst of a law, a very, very difficult world. Is the world going to get more difficult or less difficult? Yes, the Bible says, even men and seducers, seducers shall wax what? Worse and worse. The world is not getting better, the world is getting worse. So hardships will get more, it will become more intense, and we have to, we have, but the Lord says, don't worry, I have overcome, I will help you. So we have to wait with humility. Now, now here is, here's David's word. My heart is not proud, Lord. David is, is talking, in, I think it's Psalm 131. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters of things or, uh, or things too wonderful for me. I have calmed and quieted myself. I'm like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child, I am content. Notice a lot of information here, Psalm 131. 
It, Psalm 131 has three verses. So I've just given you the three verses of Psalm 131. Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and forevermore. So there's a lot of content there that, that David is, is sharing with us. Um, let's, let's see if we can go through some. Give me some of the things that you notice there before I go through the, some bullet points. Well, what do you see there that you think is worth, worth commenting out about David's attitude? Give me some thoughts. Anybody? Well, first of all, he says his heart is not proud. He's not haughty. Yeah, have you noticed that? He says, I'm not, I'm not a proud person. Now, did David have reason to be proud? What are some of the reasons he had to be proud? Beg pardon? Was, yeah, actually, he was very good looking. The Bible says that he was actually a good looking person. He was, he was, he was, um, he was, what was this color they said? It was um, ruddy, ruddy, Red, you know, so reddish brown. And, and he was, um, so, you know, he, you know, he was a shepherd. He, he sang well. He was a man who had a lot of courage. Even when he was a shepherd boy, they recognized his courage. It's amazing, isn't it? So he was courageous. He's good looking. Well, what, else, what are the reasons he had to be proud? He won a lot of awards. He was the one that fought Goliath and beat him. With a, with, with a child's toy, <laughs> a slingshot and five stones. You know, the guy, is, the, guy, the, guy, the, guy is, the guy is attacking a giant with a water gun, a water pistol. Like, exactly how you, plan to, how you plan to kill this man. And that's how ridiculous this thing is. The guy is basically, in our terms, attacking a, attacking a bandit with a water pistol. And yet the Lord is able to deliver him. You see, we don't always put, the, you know, we see a stone and it, don't always put it, a slingshot on a stone. In our days is attacking a, a bandit with a water pistol. You, you say, well, there's no way. So you could understand why the children of Israel said, what, what are you thinking? Why would you not go out with a gun? Why would you not at least take a sword? And, and the king says, well, take my own. You know, I, I give you a sword, I give you some weaponry and so on. And David says, no, I'm going to go with a water pistol. And he said, well, David, you're surely going to die. This is an absolutely stupid plan. But God is able to deliver him. You see? So he had, he had a lot of things to be proud of. Then he, he was made captain of the army. The Bible says Saul had killed his thousand, but David had killed his tens of thousands. Was a very successful military man, you know. So he had a lot of things to be proud of, yet he says, I will not be proud. He calmed himself and he says, we ain't, we're going to talk about that. And he put his hope in the Lord. All right, let's look at it. He was the author of, of, one, of one, the psalm. He, he was a, a future, he was a king, good looking and a king. That, that, that gave him some problems, by the way. What, what problem he got into because he was good looking and a king? The girls didn't, didn't the, the girls weren't shy. <laughs> they weren't shy with him at all. So being good looking and a king, so you see, come back tall, that kind of handsome or short, fat and ugly. You got to, <laughs> depending on what you're looking for. He was tall, dark and handsome. See, Saul was the classical tall, dark and handsome kind of guy. But that got him in all kind of problems, you know, all sorts of problems with the girls and so on. Um, and then, of course, he defeated the giant, won thousands of battles. You know, he was claimed as a king, you know, a mighty king over Israel. And yet, despite that, he, be, he remained humble, you know. He says, I will not see great matters or things too high. He's not trying to be overly proud. And um, he didn't take honors for himself, though he had, he had credentials that allowed him to do that. So, so there's something less, there are lessons to be learned there for us exam as well. He, he said, he, said um, he, he confessed that pride has no value. Does, does pride have any value? Does, is there any value in being proud? It's dangerous. It's dangerous. Why? Yes, it always assumes you are greater than you are. It, it puts you there for a disadvantage. Because you always think you're better than you are. You always think you're better than somebody else than you are. So dangerous, it's a very dangerous thing to do. It means that you don't, de you learn not to, to ask or depend on other things. You have too much confidence in yourself. Now, you have, you, is there anything wrong with having self-confidence? Should you have self-confidence? Yes. Yeah, but you should not be overconfident. You ought to be confident enough to know that you can do the job that has been assigned to you. So the reason I'm standing up here is because I have a certain level of confidence that I can do the job I've been asked to do. But don't, don't come up and think, well, I'm the best teacher in the whole wide world. Like, where did that come from? You know, so, so it's, having confidence is important, but being ridiculously uh, prideful is not. Look at Psalm 131. My heart is not proud. Lord, my eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. So in other words, he's not, he's not going to be overly, try to overdo what he thinks he is. He's not the greatest person in the world. 
Look at look at Proverbs 16, 18. It's just just it is it is dangerous. Pride goes before what? Destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. So anybody who is prideful, you know where they're heading. They're heading for, for a big, big fall. So yeah, yeah and, and, and prideful goes with narcissism. Generally, narcissistic people are, are, are very proud and, um, and they're going definitely for a fall, you know? All right, let's go on again. Nothing, do we have anything to boast about? Do, is there anything that we have we can boast about? Yes or no? Yes. In terms of spiritually, yes. what can we boast about? Yes, we can't boast about ourselves, but we can boast about him. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Is that, is that, no, God didn't say not wise. He says, but if you're wise, don't glory in your wisdom. Let not the powerful man, the mighty man, glory in his might, his strength, whether that's political might or, or financial might or physical strength, doesn't matter. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. So what should we glory? We shouldn't glory in our riches, in our might, in our wisdom. What should we glory in? Let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, saith the Lord. So the only thing we need to delight in, the only thing we need to be prideful of is that we know the Lord. That you understand and you know him. You understand and know him. So that's the only thing we should talk about um, we shouldn't be elevating ourselves and, and, and trying to be prideful at all. Uh huh. In what way? Sure, sure, sure. You can become. You, you have to be careful with with your, with your humility. You could become very proud of being so humble. <laughs> I'm so proud. I'm so humble. And and and, and you've got to be careful of this of this um this this sin is a horrible thing, doesn't it? It really messes up the mind. The, the Bible says the heart of man is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, even when you think, you, even when you think you're being humble, it has been mixed with pride. That's a shame, isn't it? Hmm. Yeah, so you have to be careful that, you know, you know, you know and you could hear it in, 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 in very subtle ways, you know. Well, the church was in trouble until I prayed. Have you heard that one? It's when I prayed, the Lord answered my prayer. Really? You think? So that you can be very proud in your own, in your religion and your own, your faith. And so be careful of that. All right. So the, the writers will acknowledge God's greatness. Um, we won't be depending on us. We won't be showing up ourselves, but we certainly will be depending on the Lord. Psalm 123, 1 and 2. Unto you I lift up my eyes, you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of the servant look to the hand of the master, and as the eyes of the maid to the hand of her mistress, so likewise our eyes look to the to your lord until he has mercy on us so 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 you you don't depend on you you depend on him you know you know you know psalm, psalm 126 says I, I shall i lift up my eyes eyes onto the hill from from whence cometh my help my help cometh from the lord who made heaven and earth so the hills can't help you but the lord can so so we would lift up our eyes onto him who dwells in the heaven now interesting he says as a servant looks at the hand of the master what, what is that suggesting? What's the relationship between a servant and a master? Yes, he is, he is, he is dependent on a master. Just like, you know, just like a, a, an employee is dependent on the, on the employer for his job. So he says that you depend on me, just to give you an example. And God's work in the world is even beyond human comprehension. So, so David was saying, I, all these, these high concepts that God is, is really talking about, I myself don't understand it. Psalm 139 verse 6, such knowledge is what? It's too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. You know, when we try to understand the creation of God, such, wonder, such knowledge is too wonderful for us. We, we, we can explain it, but sometimes we can't define, define it or describe it. We can't always explain it. It's too wonderful for us. So, so mankind believes that the world evolved. I do not, I mean, I'm not the brightest person in the world, but I do have a modicum of intelligence. I cannot believe how uh, a, even a semi-intelligent person could believe that. Uh, you know what I mean, Dr. Warren? I, I struggle with the concept. How would, you, how would you come up with that? You know, there is just no way you could come up with that as a, as a theory. You know, because the, 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 the universe is so complex, you know, even, even the simplest forms of life are so complicated. You know, while I'm operating in theater, I normally put up a little screen, we have a little monitor, and we put up a little na nature and so on, you know, like underwater seas. I was looking at the, um, we were looking at the, 
uh, the coral reef and the beautiful forms of life down there. You know, different colored fishes and different shapes of fishes and anemones and so on. And I looked at it just, I was just yesterday, yesterday I was operating and I was looking and I thought in my mind, how could somebody with the complexity we are seeing here believe that that evolved? How, what mechanism would you use to explain that? It just, it baffles the human mind. But that's what David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. Here is Psalm 48 verse 1, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God in the mountain of his holiness. Would you say amen to that? He is great and he is greatly to be praised for what he has done. So David acknowledges that as well. Now he talks about being weaned like a child. What was the situation with being weaned like a child? What, 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 what message is he trying to send? What is a child to his relationship to his mother? Completely what? A baby is completely dependent on, the, on his mother. Now, in, 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 uh, in, in, uh, in the Old Testament, what ages were they wean at? Anybody knows what age would be the weaning age? Sorry? Uh, yes, in that range. They, they say it's between two and nine. So Psalm 131 verse 2, but I have calmed and quieted myself. Do you notice how a baby calms himself in a mother's arm when, when he, she's been fed? He's hungry, he goes for the breast, he gets the breast milk, he gets calm and quiet. I am like a weaned child with his mother. Like a weaned child, I am, what's the next word? Content. Godliness with contentment, the Bible says, is great gain. So half of the problem we have is we're not contented. Now, contented is not enough, uh, an excuse for lack of ambition. Do, do you agree with that? Don't confuse con contentment with lack of ambition. And sometimes people, people confuse the two. What's the difference between contentment and lack of ambition? Contentment declares what? I am not going to fret about my situation. You know, it, what is lack of ambition? Be happy to stay where you are. No, you see, that's two different things. Give you an example. Well, you know, uh, my grandfather used to have a toilet in the backyard. My mother used to have their toilet in the backyard. So I'm quite happy to have a toilet in my backyard. No, you want three toilets in your house. That's ambition. That's nothing, nothing prideful. You want, you want, you want to move. Well, I, my, my, my father used to work as a dustbin man, and my nothing is wrong with working as a dustbin man. I'm just trying to make a point. Is that all right with everybody? And therefore, I'm quite happy working as a dustbin. No, you want, you want, you want to improve. Get a good education. Get a better job. That's a lack of ambition. That's not the same as contentment. The contentment is I'm working as a garbage man. Oh, boy, I can't understand what God is doing this against me. I'm a garbage man. Why? Well, instead of being grateful, you got a job. Do you understand the difference? So contentment is not the same as lack of, is not the same as a lack of ambition. Anyway, so spontaneous between two and seven, and um, the, the child seeks the tender arm of his mother for comfort and protection. And that's really what God is trying to say. That we seek God for our comfort and for our protection uh, in the quiet embrace of him. Is that good with everybody? That's, that's, that's winning like a child. What, and here's the last part of that Psalm 131 verse 3. Uh, Israel, put your hope in the Lord both now and what? Forever. We are to put our hope in the Lord. And so what God is looking for is a mature faith. A faith that has been tested by hardship. That's what God is looking for. A mature faith that has been tested by hardship. Um, and, and what is the purpose of a test? What does a test do? So we know the trial of your faith works patience. Let patience have its perfect work in you. For, you know, the Bible says, having received all, you shall stand. But, but why is God testing us? What's he trying to show? Yes, sorry? Sure, yeah. The testing pro shows what's in you. There's, there, there's no change with the test. The test only reveals what's in you. When does the change come? After the test. After the test, you get the change. All the test does is to bring out what's inside of you or what's in your heart. And so God uses a test so he can reveal to us what's hidden, what's secret in the heart. Because it's, the thing about the heart that's deceitful and desperately wicked is that you don't even know it yourself. Do you agree with that? You have no idea what you will do until you're put in a particular situation. That's why I've given up the idea of saying, well, I never do that. <laughs> I, I, never, I never say I will never do that. They'll be surprised what you and I will do, put in, a, in, in certain situations. So God brings you in a test to show you what's in your heart, and then you come to the Lord and ask God to help you to, to gain the victory over it. So that's the purpose of a test. Why does God not give us a test and reveal everything in our heart one time? Why is it progressive, in other words? 
Because if God revealed everything in the heart, what would happen to us? You become overwhelmed. You get overwhelmed. Well, Lord, burn me up now. What's the point? You might as well burn me up now. There's no way I'm going to make it in. So God just reveals small amounts, gives you a chance to overcome it. And that's the purpose of the light. All right, so we've done two things already. Let's go. I might get through two more. I'll try and see how much I can get through. Uh, look at waiting in difficult times. Remember, waiting means to trust. How do we trust when we're going through difficult times? So Psalm 126 is, is a song of ascent. Uh, you remember what the song of ascents are? What were the songs of ascent? So when they were ascending, when they were going up the hills to go to Jerusalem, which is on a which is on a hill, as they were walking up the hill, they would sing these songs of ascent. There were about fifteen of them, and this was one of the songs of ascent. We've looked at some of the others last week and the week before. This is another song of ascent. So that the the pilgrims, as they are coming up to Jerusalem for one of their pilgrim days, they would sing this song. This one was written by 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 um, by David. Uh, and it's a song, it's a song that, that they remembered how God delivered them from Babylonian captivity. So every, you should always try and figure out why it is, what was the background story. This particular one is the restoration from, from the exile. When were, the, when were they in exile in Babylon? From when to when? 586. Yeah, till about 606 BC, 607, some people say. It has to be absolutely accurate because you're dealing with many, many years ago. So they went Babylon for a little while. That's when they sung the song in Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, we sat down uh, and we wept when we remembered Zion. And then they said, then they have our captives who came and asked of us to sing a song. And what, is, what did they say? They said, we hung our harps on the willow trees. They said, but then they said unto them, how can we sing the songs of Zion? when we're in a strange land. How can you sing the, the merry songs when we're struggling? And you know, that's a, that's a good question for all of us. It's easy to sing the songs of Zion when things are going well. When you come to church and everything is going wrong and you're still happy to sing the songs of Zion, that's, that's your test. That is our test. So anyway, so this is one of the songs as they remembered the captivity. So when the Lord brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dreamt, who had a dream. So they were, they were happy that God had brought them back from the captivity of Zion, captivity in Zion. And uh, it, it, they said, it, you know, they felt it was too good to be true. It was like a dream. But was it true? Did God deliver them? Yes. Even when they were in Babylon, the Lord said, I prepared a place for you. I've, I've chosen Cyrus, my man. So God, it was, it was a dream come true. And they were now, every time they were going up to, to, to Jerusalem, they would sing these songs. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with singing, you see. Uh, they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. And, uh, and the Lord has done great things for us, for we are, and we are glad. So, so this was the songs of Zion here. And then you'll see they were, he says they, their mouth was filled with laughter, their tongue with singing. They were so, uh, why were they so happy? Because God had deliver them. Have you ever been in a deliverance? Has God ever delivered you? You'll, be, you'll see how happy you are. Very happy. So here's a few commentaries, a few bullet points. So the, the, the song was, their mouth was filled with laughter, their tongue, with singing. They were, they, were, they were just celebrating what God had done. They celebrated with their mouth and with their tongue. Uh, they were just happy. They wanted to praise the Lord. Now, not only were they celebrating, the Bible says, the Lord has done great things for whom? Yeah. For them. So who is speaking? Who is speaking? Is, is it the children of Israel speaking? No, it's the nations talking about what God had done because it says for them. So here it is, even the unlooking nations had to declare that God was working for them. And he was truly great. You see, they, you know, so when God blesses you, the nations, the people around would see that God is blessing you. They will acknowledge that the blessing of God is on your life. Would you say amen to that? And here's the third part of it. The Lord, and then they are speaking now. The Lord has done great things for us. You know, you see the difference now? The Lord has done great things for us. We are glad. This was not emotionalism. This was just gratitude for the wonderful way God had, uh, had treated them in the past. They were confident of what God was doing. Uh, to their ancestors. Remember, these are people singing many years in the days of Jesus. They were still singing these songs of ascent. So it had happened to them. They were, just, they were grateful for what God had done in the past for their ancestors. And they declared, we are glad. Why would they be glad of what God did for, the, for their ancestors? 
Yes. Because if God could do it for you, then surely God can do it for me. Do you see the value of your testimony? Because you're saying to look, this is what God has done for me. Uh, and God is still sitting on the throne. He hasn't gotten up off, his, off the seat. And if God can do this for me, then surely God can do it for you. And so they were just happy that they were glad because they knew God had done it for their ancestors and God would do it for them as well. So bring back the captivity of this. Uh, look, at, look, look what it's now. It's verse, it's this six verses in this psalm, psalm. Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. So, so what does that mean? What does that mean? Bring back our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. Any thoughts? Streams of water, yeah. So, so they realized that the work was not yet done. In other words, they're saying, look, restore, restore us again. It's because bring back our captivity. In other words, take us out of our captivity. Because the work was not yet finished, the restoration work had only just begun. So they're saying, you need to help us just as you have them. In other words, it's a plea for help. And the next part about it, I'll show you in a little bit. Um, so in other words, what they were saying is, Lord, the same way you worked in past generations, work for us too. That's what we're saying. Same way you work for them. Now you can use that in your past. The servant of the Lord, Ellen White, says we have nothing to fear for the future, except what? Lest we forget the way God has led us in our past history. Not just in our past, in our past history. You can go back and say, look, God did this for me then. Surely God is going to do it for me again. That's the value of your testimony. So bring back our captivity. The streams of the south is a metaphor because in the south, the very south was very arid, very dry. And, uh, and suddenly they would have this water and, and, and the water would fill the earth and it would form these streams as heavy river, as heavy rains would come. What are those rains called? The former and the latter rains. That's so, so they would have these rainy seasons. And when it came, the, the desert would become um, pleasant. It would become again regrown. And the streams therefore played such an important success in the agricultural season. So what he's praying for is that God will restore them. I think I'm making that point. Um, God will restore to them back into their productivity, agricultural productivity. That, that's in spiritually. So here's a few texts on that. Psalm 131, 5 and 6. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy. He who goes, he bringing in the sheaves, goes who goes forth weeping, bearing seed to sowing, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing sheaves with him. From which the song comes, bringing in the sheaves. That's where that song comes from. It's actually from this psalm. So we sow in tears, we reap in joy. Um, so what is the psalmist reminding us about here? There's something, what, what, what do you pick up here from this? We say we, that you're bringing the sheaves, but what's the first part? How do you sow? How do you sow in? Tears. In other words, when you're looking at Psalms, that he's reminding us the joy is often preceded by tears. Weeping will last for a moment, joy comes in the morning. Weeping will last for the night, rather. So before you come, before you get joy, there's always a season of weeping. So when the season of weeping comes, don't get discouraged. It's required. God says the season of weeping, the image of sowing and reaping and, and reaping in, 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 in joy is what happens. So in other words, you will have difficulty in one life, but then what happens? God is able to bring you through into a season of joy. So sometimes you're going through a little tribulation, a trial period. Don't get discouraged. Joy is coming in the morning. You just have to persist and be persevere. So we have a glimpse of the future. Let's see what the glimpse of the future is. What's the glimpse of the future? Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper. <laughs> is that, it's great, isn't it? And the tread of grapes to him who sows the grape. And the, the mountain shall drip with sweat, sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. What is that text telling us? That you will you start to operate in what? The time will come when you will start to operate in abundance. Are you seeing it now? He says at some point, give, if you don't give up, you know, we, if we faint not, is what, um, it, what, what Paul says, you know, then we will reap with, with abundance in an abundant way. So we will reap in abundance. And here it is, I will bring back the captives of my people. They shall build the way cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat the fruit of them. What, is that, what does that sound like, that text? The earth made new, Isaiah chapter 5, Isaiah 66. They shall build houses and live in them. They shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit thereof. So it's just a prophecy of what's to come. 
even though it's found in the book of Amos, I will plant them in their land, no longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. So it's a prophecy of the world tomorrow. It's a prophecy of the new world, prophecy of the world tomorrow. So we are looking forward to the time when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the tread of grapes to him that sows the seed. In other words, we shall, we shall be reaping in abundance. And, and it's a glimpse of the future to come. Uh, maybe I'll do five more minutes. I, I, as I said, I, I, it's always more material. <laughs> yeah, more material than I always want to, but I, I, I do prefer to do it thoroughly rather than halfway. So let's look about waiting for God in God's Sabbath rest. We've we got to wait in the rest of God. And that's Psalm, Psalms, Psalm 92 is a Sabbath song. It's a, remember Psalms were songs. Psalm 92 is a Sabbath song. And it, it, it reflects on, on the, the two aspects of Sabbath, creation and redemption. Yeah? So creation, there are two things that God ordained before sin became, came on the earth. Which, what were the two things before sin started? Talk to me, anybody. Sabbath and marriage. Actually, the other way around is marriage and then Sabbath. That's why the Bible says the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So marriage came first, and then comes the Sabbath for man, for man to enjoy. And then in the redemption process, God still says they required, we are therefore required to keep a Sabbath to the people of God. There remains a Sabbath. So that's in um, Hebrews chapter 4. So look at Psalm 92 verse 12. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Wonderful, isn't it? See, you know, the, the palm trees are very strong and they're very fruitful. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Wonderful promises are of, of us um, in, in, in this particular psalm. So God, God, is, God is talking about the, the, what it would be like in the creation, the first Sabbath, we said. And then he talks about what it would be like in the second Sabbath, the redemption process, in the latter part of Psalm 92. So Psalm 92 is a Sabbath psalm. So let's look at Psalm 92, verses 1 and 2. It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to do what? To sing, remember, this is a Sabbath song. To sing praises to your name, O Most High, to declare your loving kindness in the what? In the morning and your faithfulness every night. You see, God is loving kind to us in the morning. And in the night, we can say God was what? God was faithful. In other words, he kept his promises. Isn't that wonderful? In the morning, he says, I'm going to give you promises. I'll, I'll, I'll guide you going, in and going out and you're coming in. I'll give you prosperity in the land. You will, you will not, you will, you will lend and not borrow and so on. And then you come home in the evening and you look back and you say, you know what? God is faithful. God has been faithful. So we can enjoy the Sabbath rest because he's loving kindness to us and he's faithful. Here it says, verses 4 and 5. For you, Lord, have made me glad through your work. I will triumph in the works of your hands. O oh Lord, how great are your works. Your thoughts are very deep. What works did God, remember it's a Sabbath, it's a Sabbath, Sabbath hymn. What work did God create? He created the universe, he created the earth, and then he created man, and he created everything within it. It's the entire creation that God says. And David says, I will rejoice in the works of your hands. You know? So the work of redemption and the work of creation should inspire us when we come to church. What wonderful things God has done for us. I'm just bullet pointing because I'm, I'm running a bit late. So it is good, lift, no, good to give thanks to the Lord. Look at Psalm 92 verse 6. A senseless man does not know, nor does a fool understand this. That's why the Bible, uh, the, in the psalmist it says, a fool had said in his heart, there is what? There is no, it's a foolish man that says that. We we'll look at the works of his hands. How do you come up with that idea? I just do not know. I really struggle with that every time, as I said. A fool will not understand this. Uh, and, 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 but it's, it's senseless. It's absolutely senseless. And I honestly think the evolutionists know that, to be honest. I, I don't, I, I, you know, because you cannot look, I mean, there's, there's, these are smart people too. But you cannot look at what we're looking at and, and conclude that this evolved. There's no way you can do that. No, nobody does that. Um, but they, they, they have to stay in their deception. So, so God, God gives us an unparalleled advantage over enemies. Look at Psalm 92, verses 8 and 9. But you, Lord, are on high forevermore. For behold, your enemies, O Lord, for behold, your enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. So we know at some point, all of this evil that we... Is there a lot of evil going on in the world right now? Oh my goodness, you know, you can't catch... You just don't know what to do anymore. I almost don't like listening to the news. I get discouraged. 
It's terrible. You know, it's just, it's just evil. And that's what they can report. There's a lot of things that are so evil that they can't even report it. It is so horrible. That's going on right here in, in, this, um, in this country. You know, they can't even report it. They, you, but you see it because they have a lot of reports of these policemen who get PTSD because they go to a crime scene. And, and it's so horrible that they, it, you know, just they, they struggle with it. They get PTSD with it. All right, let's, you, so it says, look, Psalm 92, you have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. Fine oils have been poured on me. Anybody can explain that, that text? You have exalted my horn like that. What horn is power? Or oh, wild ox? Your, the oils have been... No, when, when do they pour oils on a person? An anointing. So he's talking about anointing service. But they used to anoint also the dead animal. But in this case, this one is not so much anointing a dead animal. It's anointing a living animal, fresh oil which talks about consecration. So, so it is this mixing, the word for mixing of the oil with the sacrifice. So in other words, the Bible implies that we are living sacrifice. Now remember Paul talks about that here? Look at Romans 12, 1. Therefore I urge you, brethren and sisters, in view of the God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a what? Now a living sacrifice is an oxymoron. Ox a sacrifice is dead, whereas... This is a living system of Zimmeron. But what Paul is making the point and what, what David is making the point is that he anoints you and that your sacrifice that is given to him. Your body is a living sacrifice and this is, this is proper worship. We are to consecrate our entire body to him, everything. We are to consecrate everything to him. All right, uh, no, and I'll probably just try and close with this now because I've got to stop. They shall bear fruit in the old age. They shall be fresh and flourishing to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him at all. Would you say amen to that? There is no unrighteousness in the Lord. We can be sure to proclaim he is my righteousness. He's my rock. In him there is no injustice. So we can be confident about who God is for sure. Uh, I'm just going to close this off because, because this is, uh, yeah, I just had two slides, but let's just conclude. So look at servant of the Lord. We are looking for the second coming of Christ. Actually, God is looking for us. Our hope of his soon appearing in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory fills our hearts with joy. When the Savior comes, those who are prepared to meet him will exclaim, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. A crown of life that faded not away is reserved in heaven for the redeemed, who in heaven will be kings and priests unto God. This is the hope set before us. What a hope it is, she says. Oh, that everyone may be ready for Christ's coming. God grant that you may be what? Overcomers. Good word, isn't it? A good encouraging thought for us. We're always encouraged by what the servant of the Lord has to say. Um, but it's also always at the end of a, of a message. So God is good. We've seen four, four, four of the five Psalms. The last one is just too much. I couldn't go through in time. But I think we've got the message that God is our strong tower and we can trust in him. Do you agree with that? We can trust in him. We don't need to be afraid. There's no unrighteousness in him. He has power. He sits on high. He will give us the benefit even though we have to go through little difficult times. Don't get discouraged. Weeping may, may endure for the night, but joy comes when? In the morning. If we faint not, the Bible says that we, if we faint not, we shall, we shall reap. It says you shall reap if we faint not. All right, let us pray as we close this part so we can go to the service upstairs. And thank you for your time. And may God bless you. Looking forward to seeing you next week. And uh, there is a new, I will uh, post it, the new uh, online in the Reedy Creek Journal. So the Reedy Creek Bulletin has the new online Zoom if you want to connect up with Zoom. But uh, hopefully on YouTube, I'll post it again. Let us pray. Father, again, we thank you for a good word that we're always encouraged by the word that you give us, that you are our refuge and our strength. You are, there is no unrighteousness in you, and we can wait on you. We can trust in you. We can submit to your will, and we know that you will do everything well for us, for you are a God of loving kindness, and you're faithful to us. So now bless us as we close this meeting, but bring us back again another week where we can hear more of this wonderful word is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody. God bless. And uh, looking forward to seeing you next week. Uh, I'll post the YouTube video again uh, for those who are not here. God bless. See you later today.